Noam Chomsky, thanks so much for joining me. Glad to be with you. What I want to ask you about today is some of the challenges in, in confronting the major issues of our time, not challenges in terms of facts, but challenges in terms of how we actually go about building something positive and also just building something against the, the power structures. With such massive, massive issues, I'm thinking particularly about climate change. Uh, I think there's particular challenges that, that come along with that. Um, and one of the main ones, I think, is sort of the lack of feedback that happens if you're trying to do something positive about them, trying to make something happen. And as someone who's confronted huge issues before that seemed hopeless at the time, like Vietnam, I was wondering if you had any thoughts on how we can, as individuals and as groups, go about trying to organize and confront something as major as climate change when it can feel like you're pushing a giant rock and, and not getting anywhere, the problem of how you do something without necessarily getting positive feedback. Well, you can't expect positive feedback from power systems. No, they have their own interests. Let's say, take climate change. Canada is a good place to think about this. That Canada used to be a pretty civilized society by comparative standards. And now it's becoming the scourge of the earth. Uh, it's partly uh, Canadian mining operations, which are very destructive all around the world and are arousing great resistance among the victims, mostly indigenous people. Uh, but uh, also the uh, dedication to uh, uh, develop the most harmful uh, forms of fossil fuels. Uh, just this morning's newspaper, there's a discussion and take a look at the business section of the New York Times. It discusses Canadian plans, plans of Canadian corporations and the Canadian government to uh, uh, vastly expand the uh, pipeline system uh, to the west to aim for the Asia market and to the east uh, so as to uh, be able to reach directly to Europe with, and the rest of the world without going through the United States. And it points out that there are difficulties. At the West, there are problems with First Nations. The town where they wanted the major export terminal to be has voted strongly against allowing it to be used. The indigenous groups are struggling hard against it. Uh, this is typical. This tells you, first of all, it's partially an answer to your question. It also tells you something very interesting about the current world. Uh, take, say, Canada. I and mean, this is typical. The richest, most educated sectors of the society with the greatest advantages are pressing very hard to escalate the threat of global destruction. The uh, people who we consider primitive, you know, in Canada, First Nations, uh, in Latin America, indigenous people, in Australia, uh, Aboriginal tribes, in India, but tribal societies. Now, they're the ones who are trying to retard the threat. And what's happening in Canada is typical. And it is a kind of an interesting, you know, if you're, if you can separate yourself from the horrifying consequences, it's an, it's an interesting kind of paradox, if you like. Uh, but it tells you the answer to your question. It's urgent for those who have the most privilege, the most opportunity, the greatest advantages uh, to be in the forefront instead of in the rear in uh, trying to uh, impede uh, what is likely to be a serious catastrophe. Again, take a look at this, uh, this morning's newspaper. The lead story in uh, the New York Times, other newspapers, is uh, several scientific reports that just came out about um, uh, Antarctic ice melting, West Antarctic ice melting. Uh, it's now pretty much determined that it's taking place and probably irreversible. Uh, and the predictions are that it'll keep increasing sea level rise, but within a few generations, it'll escalate very fast to about a 10 foot rise in sea level. Uh, take a look at the world and ask what it'll be like with a 10 foot rise in sea level. Well, while we're looking at that, we see that uh, in Canada and in the United States, uh, those sectors of the population which have most power, most influence, most advantage, are trying to race as fast as possible towards this destructive outcome. Meanwhile, First Nations and their counterparts elsewhere are trying to retard it. Uh, that's the answer.
uh, popular forces just have to move up to the front and not uh, not accept what's being done in their name. And there's no big secret about how to do that. I mean, every positive social change in history that I can think of has worked pretty much the same way. Grassroots organizing, uh, the development of popular movements, uh, and finally enough pressure on the uh, centers of power so that they're compelled to respond. And that can happen. We don't live in totalitarian dictatorships. Uh, we're, by comparative and historical standards, they're very free to act. Sure, there'll be repression that's taken for granted, but uh, nothing like what's been faced in the past or is faced elsewhere. And uh, therefore, it's really a matter of will and choice. The The situation is, is so big, though, and there's so many different you know, avenues you could go about trying to to work on on the issue. And I think, at least for me, if, if you just focus on the facts of the matter, it's very easily to quickly feel paralyzed and not know how to, to move forward. You know, you, you've talked about when you were first getting involved with the Vietnam War, uh, yourself and others would try to give speeches and it would be to a tiny group of people, maybe basically just the organizers and, and one other person. You said at the time things felt completely hopeless, that it would be impossible. And you just kept going anyways. And so I was wondering what your thoughts on this for climate change are. I mean, do you think generally it helps to try to focus on one small area, even if it seems trivial in, in the vast scale of things, and, and try to work on that in order to get a sense of, of feedback and like you are having an impact? Depends who you are and where you are. There's no single right answer for everything. There are some places where maybe the most important thing you can do is uh, institute local pressures to uh, support, let's say, use of solar power or wind power or weatherization of homes. Uh, there are other places where maybe the most important thing to do is to press for uh, control over the plans to create pipelines and impede them. I mean, if First Nations can do it, there's no reason why people in Toronto can't. Uh, but there's simply no single answer. We, we have all kinds of ways of... It's, it's very different from the early Vietnam War movement. Then, the, as you mentioned, there was no support. And now there's pretty substantial recognition that there's a serious problem. Actually, some polls, just international polls, just came out a couple of weeks ago. I don't think they included Canada, but I'm sure Canada would be in the mainstream spectrum. It's, uh, there's pretty high recognition in the population of the world that there's a serious problem. I think the highest that they found in the international poll was Brazil, the more than three quarters. Uh, the United States is below the norm, but that's for a simple reason. Partly you can see it outside this window uh, where you see the Koch uh, Cancer Center. There's a huge propaganda campaign, perfectly public, nothing secret about it, by uh, major sectors of the corporate system, energy, uh, American Chamber of Commerce, others, uh, working really hard to try to convince people that either there's no global warming at all, or if there is, uh, humans have no role in it. Uh, that's, and, and that has had an effect on the population. It's below the global norm. And it's interestingly stratified. So if you, if you break it up, when the polls break it up into Democrats and Republicans, the Democrats are somewhat below the global norm. Republicans are off the planet. You know, they're way down at the bottom. And they are the ones who are lockstep dedicated to the service of wealth and power. And for them, what happens in the future just doesn't matter. I mean, you have to recognize that in the moral calculus of uh, North American state capitalism, the fate of your grandchildren amounts to essentially nothing as compared with the need for profit tomorrow. Now, people can understand that. It's not like the anti-war movement. The majority of the population already understands it. Uh, the point is to get them active, energized, uh, all kinds of ways, uh, protests, uh, sit-ins, uh, take over buildings, whatever it takes to try to make it possible for our near descendants, it's not very far off, to have a chance for a decent living. That's a pretty straightforward message. One of the things that you always point out is 
you know, if, if you were asked before the civil rights movement, would it make sense for someone to uh, stage a sit-in at a counter? Uh, you would have said probably not. And, and same with the, the Occupy movement. If people asked you, should you have a camp in at, at Zuccotti Park? You'd have said, be a waste of your time. And I guess one of the main issues is we never know what's what's actually going to work. Sometimes we can, despite our best efforts, it might even be a pushback where we actually lose ground. And so I wanted to get your thoughts on how, how does one keep forward or keep going in the face of not knowing if the tactics that you are pursuing are, are even worthwhile or not? Well, as you've just indicated, I'm probably the worst person to ask because my judgment has often been wrong. Now, the first case you mentioned was the uh, Greensboro, North Carolina, a couple of black students sitting in at a lunch counter. And my assumption when I heard about it is this is going to be smashed instantly. It turned out to be a spark that set off a huge popular movement. Uh, Occupy, if I can, fortunately I wasn't asked, but if I had been, in Zuccotti Park, I would have said, you're wasting your time. Turned out not. Uh, sometimes I think it's my judgment isn't right, other times not. But the point is you really don't know. So how do you keep going? You consider the alternatives. The one alternative is to say, look, I don't know if it's going to work, so I'll do nothing, thereby helping ensure that the worst will happen. Now, the other possibility is to say, look, I don't know whether it's, it'll work. I'll use my best judgment. If my best judgment is, look, there's a chance it'll succeed, I'll try, and then we'll see. But it's not a secret. There's no magic keys to these things. These are the only thing, ways anything has ever worked in the past, sometimes successfully. Sometimes there is an error, and you get a bigger backlash, and the net effect is negative. You can't be sure. You can only think it through as carefully as possible, and do what seems best. Do you also think part of the issue is realizing how how difficult it's going to be in a lot of ways? You you gave the example uh, somewhere I read about Columbia students occupying the universities in 1968, and there's sort of this attitude that like, well, well, we'll do that, and then our work will be done. Not sort of understanding just how how much power, how much inertia, how much institutional structures you're up against. Do you think just understanding how how difficult it's it's going to be is important in, in ensuring that one doesn't burn out when you're when you're working on these things. I have a realistic sense of how social change takes place, what the structures of power are like. Take for granted that they're going to resist change that harms their interests in any way they can. But when you say it's uh, there's a couple of points to bear in mind uh, in the United States and Canada. A lot of the activism for a long time, uh, last 20 or 30, 30, maybe half century, has been initiated by young people. That is, people who do not have an institutional memory. It's not like uh, the labor movement or the old Communist Party or others who knew, look, we're in it for the long haul. Uh, it's not going to, we're not going to have a victory tomorrow. Maybe it'll be a defeat tomorrow, but it'll lay the basis for going on beyond because we have a conception of uh, what uh, institutional structure is like. Now, the Columbia students in 68, I mean, I knew a lot of them, they literally thought that if they sat in the president's office for a couple of weeks, uh, we'll have peace and love. Well, the world doesn't work like that. You have to understand how it does work. And then if you have a partial defeat, which is likely, say, you know, the police come in and destroy uh, the Zuccotti Park encampment, well, you go on to the next thing. You say, take for granted that's the way power systems work. We'll say, we're ready, we'll go on to the next thing. We already planned for it. Of course, you have to sort of deal with the enormity of the, the scale of, of what you're up against. That's the second point I was going to make. The enormity is less than it has been. Uh, we're much more free today than in the past and than in other places. By comparative and historical standards, the barriers are not high. A lot of freedom has been won over the years. The kind of actions that the police used to take with impunity are unthinkable now, except with regard to you know, the, the people who are so lacking in privilege that uh, they can be attacked with impunity. But for most of us, by now, the uh, uh, the barriers are very limited as compared with what has been true and what is true elsewhere. 
I mean, you want to see what barriers are? Take a look at that. That photograph, that painting over there. That's a painting of uh, uh, what happened in El Salvador a week after the fall of the Berlin Wall, where leading intellectuals were just massacred by the uh, uh, by by the army uh, on the orders of the high command who broke into the university and murdered them. We're not facing that. And yet, despite this, despite the fact that the oppression and the obstacles faced elsewhere are are much bigger. I think there are subtle, subtle difficulties that that I think maybe we, most of us, underestimate how how powerful they are. Like just pure uh, social factors of of wanting to get along. I mean, you've talked a lot about how you went to all, sort of an alternative school until you were twelve, um, where you didn't even know you were a good student. There was no there was no real competition. But for the vast majority of us, we we spend the first twenty years or, or so of our life basically learning to get ahead and learning that our validation comes from pleasing those in authority. And I think this this plays a much bigger effect on us than, than we really realize it. And you've talked about this yourself, how, you know, you you meet the people, you go to a place like Harvard or something when you're doing the fellowship and they seem nice and you just want to get along. And, and before you know it, you, you're sort of conforming and you just don't want to cause a ruckus. Just compare the pressures with conform to for conformity with the fear of getting your brains blown out by the military. There's a big difference. We're lucky to face the pressure. There are pressures for conformity, obedience, passivity, but to overcome that is very slight as compared with uh, overcoming the uh, violence of the state. It's true, but I think the one problem with the conformity is that you often don't even recognize that it's occurring. It's harder to see. Actually, it's pretty easy to see. You have to think about it. And uh, then you can, and, if, and then you can make a decision of: Do I want to conform or do I want to overcome it? There's nothing new about this. I mean, uh, I'm sure you've read Animal Farm. I'm pretty sure you haven't read the introduction to Animal Farm because it wasn't printed. Uh, it was found later in Orwell's unpublished papers. Uh, it, it was kind of interesting. What he points out is that in he, the, the book itself is the satire, the totalitarian enemy where there really are barriers, harsh barriers, uh, so harsh that to try to overcome them can mean, you know, death, imprisonment, torture, and so on. And he compares it with England. He says, look, England's a free society. But in England, I'm quoting now, unpopular ideas can be suppressed without the use of force. And one of the reasons he gives is exactly what you said. If you've gone to the best schools and colleges, you have instilled into you the understanding that there are certain things it wouldn't do to say. But which is harder to overcome? Uh, that uh, conformism that's instilled into you or the uh, threat of the torture chamber? We're lucky. We have real opportunities, more than in the past, because a lot has been won. We have the legacy of the successful struggles of our predecessors. We can use that legacy or we can say, look, uh, it's too hard to overcome the fact that I try, want to conform. It, it's a choice and it's a choice that can be made. Um, and just a, a final question. In, there was this interview with Bertrand Russell uh, with the BBC from 1959. And, and the final question he was asked was if this, if this tape was to be found sort of like in a thousand years and, and you've had a few words of advice to that generation of, of what you have learned from your life, uh, what you've gleaned from your experiences, um, what would that be? And, and he said, would there be one intellectual thing and one moral thing? The intellectual thing is just deal with the world how it is, deal with the facts of the matter whenever you're trying to figure out how things work, not, not how you wish they were or how, what you think it would be, um, have a positive social effect to believe in just, just the facts, however dire or good they are. And the second thing is love is wise, hatred is foolish. And I, I was wondering what your answer to that would be. Would it be the same? Is there anything you would add to that? Or what, what, what have you gleaned from, from your life? Well, there he is, so we can ask him. Uh, I don't think I would put it exactly the way that, that you described, but the, the basic point is correct and very simple. Everyone knows it. First point, try to understand the world as it is, not as you wish it were. Second point, decide what outcomes you think are desirable and then ask yourself, am I willing to commit my 
energy, effort, uh, dedication to trying to achieve the outcomes that I think are beneficial. So take, say, climate change. Do I want to commit energy and effort as I can right now, not with total impunity, but with a fair amount of freedom? Do I want to commit those efforts to uh, ensuring or at least increasing the likelihood that my grandchildren will have a decent world to live in? That's a simple question. Anybody can ask themselves. And the choices possible for people like us are quite vast. Noam Chomsky, thanks so much for joining me. Yeah, thank you.